tonight together so that we can get it. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 14 reads like this. says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or you do, do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. But he who has died, uh, where it says, but he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it to, its, to do its lust. And do not present your members as instruments of righteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace." Let me pray over our Word tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. It's already anointed, but tonight I pray that You would anoint our ears to hear the truth of God's Word. Lord, I believe we live in an hour where truth has fallen in the streets. And so tonight, may we hone in spiritually, as You said in Your Word in the book of Revelation, He that has ears, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the churches. And Lord, tonight we pray that You would use this moment to develop our faith, and help us to get on the right track to victory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to say once again, welcome to everybody who's tuning in tonight. We're glad that you're here to be coming into your homes. We're launching a brand new teaching series tonight entitled Protege. The reason why we've called it Protege is because a protege is somebody who is being trained or discipled by a very successful person. And I believe that the Bible tells us that we are to walk in the likeness of Christ, be developed into the image of Christ, and ultimately we are to produce the works of Christ. That's why Jesus said to His disciples, He says that I am going away and I'm going to send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to you. And then He says, greater works than these shall you do because I have gone to the Father. I believe personally that we are supposed to live a spirit-filled, faith-empowered life and model the life of Christ. Now, when we talk about being like Jesus, most people all automatically think morally. Well, Jesus was good morally. But the Bible doesn't just teach us to be good like Jesus morally, but even the supernatural things that He did, we're supposed to walk in that. And so over the next several weeks, we're going to look at the pattern of Jesus and how He lived and our identification with Him so that we can begin to walk as Jesus walked. You know, as I was thinking about everything going on this week, I was thinking about how the world has really gone a long way in medical science. You know, over the last uh, 10 or 20 years or so, DNA has become just uh, record-breaking in the type of things that they can see, even by taking blood or bodily fluid or hair or anything, they can take that and just in an instant, they can find out your mapping of your body. In other words, DNA is like a fingerprint. There are no two people who have identical DNA. Everybody's DNA is different. So think about all of the years where people actually went to prison for crimes that they didn't commit because there was no DNA forensic science evidence. And then all of these years after they had served their sentence, it's very unfortunate that it happens, but then they find out that maybe they didn't do it because their DNA says something different. You know, the Bible gives us something interesting in the book of Genesis when Cain and Abel uh, had their situation where uh, the brother murdered his other brother because of God's rejection of his offering. The Bible says that the voice of your brother's blood is crying out from the earth. And the blood does have a voice. So much so that the Hebrews writer tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things than that 
of Abel's. What does the blood of Jesus speak? It speaks righteousness. It speaks peace. It speaks joy. It speaks the blessing of God. It speaks prosperity and healing and the joy that comes with knowing Jesus. And so when we think about the DNA that is in Christ, the Bible says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. And old things pass away and all things become new. And so now we are in the bloodline of our Heavenly Father, because we have been made new. Romans 6.4 goes as far to say that we're walking in the newness of life. That's the picture of baptism, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now, as we begin to look at this a little bit, and we think about DNA, we think about you and I as people. Our DNA is passed from our parents. In other words, when the seed of a man meets the egg of a woman and it's fertilized and it begins to create an embryo at conception, it becomes life. What we see is that at that moment, the traits of the DNA from the male and the female begin to produce the attributes of the child. So your eye color, your hair color, your cheekbones, how tall you will be, your skin complexion, all of that is passed down from our parents. So that many people, even when they're a baby, it's freaky. Because you can take their baby picture and you can put it beside the baby picture of their parents. And oftentimes you can't tell it apart. And as the child gets older, people begin to say, Oh, honey, look, he has your eyes. Or, Oh, honey, look, he has your hair or your cheekbones or your complexion. Or he smiles like you. His attitude is like you. She looks just like her mom. Because that is the attributes of DNA that is beginning to shine. And here's the thing. The more that we grow, the more we begin to look like our parents. I even noticed that uh, in some pictures that I saw of myself recently, that I would have never told you 10 years ago that I thought I looked like my father. But, but I looked back on a picture and I had to do a double take for a moment. I thought it was my dad at, at age 30. Because his DNA is on the inside of me. What am I trying to tell you? That if the DNA of Christ is on the inside of us through the new birth, that as we grow and as we mature and as we begin to develop our walk with God, we look more like Jesus or we should suppose to. So think about this. So think about this. When our children are little, what do they do? They do their best to imitate. I remember when my son Aaron was about five years old and we were youth pastoring in a little bitty small town in Arkansas. I remember one day he ran through the house with the Bible and also one of my sermon CDs that was in a case that I had ordered from a ministry off of TV of, that was a, a Bible prophecy teaching. And he ran through the house. And, and why did he do that? Because he saw Daddy do that. Or why does he get on the guitar and want to play the guitar even though he doesn't know the notes? Because he's trying to emulate and as believers who have been born of God, we ought to be trying to emulate our Heavenly Father. That's why Ephesians chapter 5 says that if you've been born in Christ, then we should walk in Him. Walking in light, walking in love, walking in fellowship with one another. And so, we ought to be learning how to emulate those things. When I was um, actually... When I was working for my dad, when I was probably 17, 18 years old, in the grocery store that he managed, they put me back in the meat market. And now, if anybody knows me out there, you know that's totally funny, but uh, I learned how to grind meat, grind sausage, debone meat, package stuff, waste stuff, cut steaks, how to use skill saws and band saws and all types of things. And But they put me back there and they gave me the lowest amount of pay you possibly could. Because I was not a meat, uh, I was not uh, technically a, a butcher, I was an apprentice. So what does an apprentice do? An apprentice is somebody who studies up underneath somebody else. And you know what a disciple is? A disciple is somebody who studies up under somebody else. They walk in their shadow and their footsteps so that they can learn to develop in their own giftings and callings. That's why whenever you see Jesus, He always has a few disciples with Him everywhere He goes. Whenever He's healing the sick, whenever He's casting out devils, whenever you have all of those things, Jesus is having His disciples, His protégés there because His intention was always to re reproduce Himself in other people. 
But as we're looking at this particular passage in uh, Romans chapter 6, we find some things that are really interesting. And it's really long, so I'm not going to read it again. But it talks about death in this passage a lot. It talks about being dead to sin and being dead with, uh, being buried with Christ and being resurrected. And so tonight, I've simply entitled this teaching, Dead Man Walking. Dead Man Walking. And do you know that the Bible teaches that as Christians, as we have been what we would call born from above or born again, we actually are supposed to be walking dead men. Can I give you a litmus test tonight to show you whether or not you are alive to your flesh or you're dead to your flesh? Can I give that to you? If you walk around angry at people all the time, it's a good indication that you're still alive to your flesh. If you're offended at people all the time, somebody didn't shake your hand, somebody overlooked you, maybe somebody said something, you interpreted it the wrong way, but you're always, I'm not talking about every once in a while, I'm talking about all the time, you're always offended. It's a good indication that you've not yet died to your flesh. See, it's impossible to offend a dead man. It's impossible to offend somebody or to hurt somebody who has died to their own senses. And the Bible teaches us over and over again that we are to die to ourself and to present our bodies as members of righteousness so that God can fulfill His plan in our life. But as we are supposed to be dead man walking, the interesting thing that I see time and time again is that people are still living unto themselves. In other words, when we have an encounter with God, there's supposed to be a change in our life. We're a Pentecostal, charismatic, full gospel church, however you want to label it. And oftentimes people have mocked us and they've criticized us because people will get excited and they will shout. Or maybe, uh, maybe people will weep when they worship or when they pray. Or maybe people shake under the power of God. Or many people, have you've seen them when hands are laid on them. Or many times when hands aren't laid on them and they fall under the power of God. And people say, well, what is that? What is that all about? Here's the, the thing, my friend. When you come into contact with the power of a living God, you cannot remain unchanged. No more so than you can walk out tonight in front of an 18-wheeler on the highway and stand in front of it and be ran over and not be impacted. So can you not come encounter with the God who spoke the world into creation and caused the stars to stand still and the earth to rotate on its axis, not too close to the moon, not too close to the sun, keep everything in balance. That God, you can't come in contact with Him and not be changed. Now, Notice I didn't say perfected, because we grow in our sanctification and our walk with God as the Holy Spirit comes into our life and He convicts us, but there ought to be a change. So tonight, I want to address in this passage that Paul deals with several things as he's dealing with the church at Rome, which by the way, Paul, much of what he wrote in the New Testament was written from a prison cell in a place of darkness and isolation. Why did I say that? Because some of you feel isolated and alone right now, and I believe God is going to speak to you in these days if you'll take advantage of what He wants to say. The first thing that I want to see out of our passage tonight in Romans chapter number 6 is the question. The question. What is the question here that Paul asks? And we find it in verse number 1. He says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. You know, one of the one of the telltale signs that a believer has not died to self is they they continue to fight for the right to live in sin. What is sin? You don't hear about it a lot today. What is sin? Is sin adultery? Is sin murder? Is sin cheating on your taxes? Well, all of those things can be sin. But the word sin from the New Testament is an archer's term like somebody who would shoot a bow and an arrow. And it literally means to miss the mark. In other words, there's this perfect bullseye and you are aiming for that and you pull back the arrow and you let it go and you hit anything other than the center, you have sinned. You have missed the mark. 
So anything other than God's perfect standard is sin. Matter of fact, the Bible goes as far enough to say this, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. So in other words, to willfully disobey the promptings of the Holy Spirit can be sin in your life. Well, you don't have to just commit murder or adultery to be a sinner, okay? That's why the Bible says we have all sinned, we have all missed the mark and fallen short of the glory of God. But thank God for grace. Is anybody thankful for God's grace? I'm thankful for grace and I'm thankful for mercy. But the, the thing that Paul's dealing with in verse number 1 and 2 is the issue of grace. And today, grace has become a buzzword, and I don't want to get contradictory tonight and controversial, and I don't want to go to calling people's names. That's not the kind of person I am. But the word grace has been a buzzword in a lot of circles, and it has brought in this ideology that the way that a believer lives his life doesn't really matter. And the Apostle Paul actually doesn't say that. Quite the contrary, he says that should we continue in sin now that grace abounds. The buzzword that people use is I'm saved. It doesn't matter what I do. I'm a Christian. My sins are covered by the blood of Jesus. And while all of that is true, my friend, the book of Galatians reminds us not to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. The word lascivious there in the Greek New Testament simply means a license to sin. Are we going to miss it? Sure. Are we covered by the blood? Sure. But the Bible has a lot to say about us walking in open rebellion. So let's look at this right now as we look at some of these things. First of all, we've got to get to a working definition of grace. What is grace? If you were to ask most people what is grace, they would say that grace is is a merited favor, which by the way, the word grace is charis, is one of the words for grace in the New Testament. People would say that grace is God's unmerited favor, and that is absolutely true. The only issue is that's not the only definition for grace. I like the way John Bevere put it in his book, Killing Kryptonite. John Bevere said that grace, while it is God's uh, undeserved, unmerited favor, Grace is also God's divine enablement to overcome. So I want you to think about it like this. In, in churches like ours, somebody sings a song, and I mean they grandstand the song, the power of God is there, you can feel it. They would say something like this, Whew, that sister was anointed to sing that song. There are other people who might would say that man, that pastor was anointed when he preached that message. Well, in this particular context, you could use the word anointed and graced the same way. You could say, man, she was graced. The grace of God was on her to sing that song. The grace of God was upon him to preach that message. So God's grace is unmerited favor, but it's also God's divine empowerment to overcome. So what does that mean? Grace isn't just there to cover our sin. Grace is there to help us break up out of our sin. In other words, the more grace you have in your life, which the New Testament says that, that God has freely given us grace, we've been saved by grace, then the, the grace in our life, the more we walk with Jesus, we ought to be busting out of those addictions, busting out of those strongholds, busting out of those things that have bound us for so long. But we have to stop using grace as a license to just keep on. He says, should we keep on sinning that grace abounds? Here's a question that I want to ask all of you tonight, listening from home. I want you to think about this. Jesus, the Bible says, was full of grace and truth. So, did Jesus walk around sinning? No, Jesus didn't walk around sinning. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you supposed to be like every other Tom, Dick, and Harry, or are you supposed to be like Jesus? Well, I'm better than so-and-so. Well, God never told you to model your life after so-and-so. Matter of fact, anytime you model your life after another believer, that even those that you look up to, you're always going to come short. Because the perfect prototype that God gave us as an example to live was the Lord Jesus Christ. And He Himself said, Be holy, for I am holy. That's what the Lord says. So, in that, we don't see Jesus walking around making excuse for sin. You see Him walking, following 
fellowshipping with the leadership of the Holy Spirit in everything that he did. So, we've got to think about that. Now, here's a, here's a verse about grace that a lot of people sometimes don't read, but it's one of my favorites, and it's in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. It's in the New King James Version, if you want to write that down or look at it tonight. Look at what Titus says about grace. Titus says, for the grace of God that notice this, what does he say? It brings salvation. Has appeared to who? All men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope, that's the rapture of the church, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So notice, everybody who is preaching, live uh, however you want to today, leave out this verse, because plainly the Bible says the grace of God has appeared to all of us, teaching us to deny ungodliness. And my friend, listen to me. We've got to learn to put down the flesh. I love the way Jesse Duplantis said it. He said, if you don't embarrass sin, sin will embarrass you. And if you don't crucify it in private, It'll ultimately crucify you in public. So, we've got to think about this question, should we continue living in sin? The question is, absolutely not. As a believer, we need to be pulling away from sinfulness. Following the grace of God that teaches us to deny ungodliness. Then, he goes on in verse number uh, 5. Let's, let's look here at a couple of these verses again if we can. Romans chapter 6. And let's pick it up at verse 3. He says, Or do you not know that as many of you were baptized into Christ Jesus, uh, were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father. Even we should walk in the newness of life. Now I don't have time to stop and teach right here, but this is one of the great significances of water baptism. It is a picture of the death of the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Matter of fact, you get saved, you can get saved anywhere, and the water doesn't save you. But baptism for the believer, one of the, one of the, one of the significant points of baptism for a believer, it's like a funeral service for your flesh. People would come from all over and say, oh, they've been converted. In the Bible days, they did it out in front of everybody, out in the open. It was to say, look, this person right here has died to themselves, they died with Christ, now they've been raised to walk in life. Now, let's look a little bit further as we look at this. Verse number um, 5, it says, For if we've been united together in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection, knowing that our old man was crucified with Him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be a slave to sin. For he who has died has been free from sin, now, if we died with Christ, believe that we should also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over Him. That's a blessing right there. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the first thing we saw was the question, but the second thing that we see is the truth. Now, the Apostle Paul has a unique perspective than anybody else in the New Testament as it pertains to the Gospel writers. Why? Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they wrote, they wrote from a perspective of walking with Jesus. They walked with Him. They were ventured with Him. And many of the different places that He went to, the miracles, they were there. They lived on this side of the cross, if you could say it like that, although they were around when Jesus uh, was resurrected. I'm not saying that, but their, their time with Christ was, was before He died. The Apostle Paul, however, came along afterward. The Bible says that he was one that was born out of due season and that how God called him to preach the gospel from a life of persecution to a life of faith, establishing uh, the New Testament church along with the other disciples. So Jesus appeared to Paul, and Paul refers to himself as the least of all of the apostles. But Paul sees the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ after these things had already happened. 
So I like to say it like this, and I've heard others say it the same way. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give you a photograph of the gospel. In other words, a photograph is a what you can see on the surface. But the Apostle Paul in the, in the epistles actually gives us an x-ray version of the gospel. In other words, it takes it beneath the surface. So uh, my friend Mark, Pastor Mark Hankin says it like this. He said that when, uh, when Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John writes, they write about Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus was resurrected, and Jesus was seated by the right hand of the Father. But when Paul writes, he writes like this. Not only did Jesus die, but you died with Him. Not only did Jesus was buried, but you were buried with Him. Not only was Jesus raised, but you were raised with Him. Not only was Jesus seated, but you're seated with Him in heavenly places. Far above all might, all power, and all dominion, seated with Him in heavenly places. So Paul gives us a perspective of the believer on the other side of the cross after Jesus had already ascended to heaven. So we see the question, should we keep living in sin? The answer is no. But the truth is this, that we have died with Christ. Our identity is found in His death. We have been buried with Him. In other words, when Jesus uh, went down into that grave and His body was there, when we identify with Christ, we also, our flesh dies. Our will should die. Everything that we are, our mind, our will, our emotions, our plans, our dreams, our, all those things, we have to let that die. And then we've been raised with Him. Do you know on that third day when the power of God came in that tomb after Jesus went down, the Bible says He that ascended first also descended down to the lower parts of the earth. He made a house call on the devil down there in the lower parts of the earth. He took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, made a display of principalities and powers openly, and then He ascended back to heaven. Man, isn't that awesome that Jesus got the victory over death? And so He was raised with the power of God. And listen, as Jesus has been raised, He's also raised us together with Him. And then Jesus sat down at the right hand of the Father. A high priest, there's, listen, it, this is so interesting. In the book of Hebrews, there is no chair, in, oh my God, in, in the holiest of holy place where the high priest can go, there's no chair there. The only time a chair is mentioned in the throne room of God is in the book of Hebrews where it talks about Jesus taking His seat. Do you know why that is? Because the work of the high priest in the Old Testament was never finished. They had to keep going and keep going and keep going. But Jesus, one time on the cross, one time in the grave, one time resurrected, completed the work forever. That's why He is our great high priest. Isn't that so awesome? We were died with Him, we were buried with Him, we were raised with Him, and we've been seated with Him. And why I'm saying this is because now we are dead to that sinful life. It no longer should have control or power over us. Believers who I see all the time who are, are making excuses for our spiritual life or before our lack thereof. You know, uh, um, nobody's perfect. And as you live... All of us are going to make a mistake from now and then. Jesus was the only one who walked around perfect. If any one of us were sinless in our phys physicalities, we'd, be, we'd qualify to be the Son of God. But no, that's not how it works. We're going to make a mistake. Here's the issue. How do you handle mistakes? As a believer, when you make a mistake, when you think a thought that you shouldn't, when you say a word that you shouldn't, when you do an action that you shouldn't, uh, are you convicted by it? Now, there's a difference between being condemned and being convicted. Condemn, condemnation comes from Satan. The Bible makes it clear that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, who don't walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. But there is conviction. In other words, the Holy Spirit can quicken to you. Hey, you shouldn't have said that. You should have walked in love. You should have exhibited the fruits of the Spirit. You should have been more compassionate. You should have held that door open. You should have gave when I spoke to you. God can speak to us in all kinds of ways. But when you make a mistake as a believer, let me ask you the question. 
Do you just pass it off and do you say, oh, well, you know, grace of God, I'm good. Or do you have the attitude of, Lord, forgive me of that. I repent. I turn in the other direction. You see, that's the attitude of believers we should have. Not to grovel in sin. If we should ever do something that grieves God's Word, goes against His principles, it's not that God's going to strike us dead and necessarily that you have to get saved all over again. No, no, no. I'm not teaching that tonight. But what I am teaching is that we want to stay in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Don't do anything to grieve His heart. And when we do, we ought to be quick to turn it around, give it to God, and walk back on the path that we should. It's not popular, but in 2020, holiness is still right. Right living, right walking and talking and, and doing the things that God has called us to do in His Word. Christians are still supposed to be a peculiar people. So, in looking at that, what, what, do we, what do we see? We see a challenge that we find in verse number 12 down through verse 14. Look at this. He says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lust, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. You are under God's divine empowerment to overcome. Think about that. So the third thing that we see is the challenge. As walking dead people... We are soldiers in the army of the living God who have died to our flesh, died to our own will and desire, died to our own agenda, and now we're saying, Jesus, you're not just my Savior, but you are my Lord, you are my Master. I am your protege. I am your disciple. Teach me, lead me, guide me. What's the challenge here when he says uh, for us to follow him? It's found in verse number 12. He says, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. Why does he say that? He says, do not let sin reign. Do you know why he says that? Because you can. You, as a believer, still have a free will. You have a, a mind, a will, and an emotion. And all of that makes up your soulish part of your body, and, or of, of your man, of your, uh, of your being. And so, as you are living, you have a choice whether or not to walk in a sinful way, or you have a choice to walk in righteousness. But he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Why? Because listen, this is an old cliche that my Sunday school ta teacher taught me years ago. If you give Satan an inch, he will become your ruler. One preacher said it like this. If you, oh, if you give him a ride to the corner store, he'll stay in for the whole family vacation. Satan, once you give him access into your life, he wants to hang on. Anywhere the enemy has a foothold, he wants to take it. But here's the thing. As believers, we have the right to kick Satan out of our lives, out of our mind, out of our thoughts, out of our words, out of our families, and not give him any place. Some of you need to shut the door in places in your life where you've allowed the enemy to come in through entertainment. And I'm Listen, I'm looking into that camera tonight. Some of you are watching me on, on TV right now that call yourself a Christian. And the moment this broadcast goes off, you're going to get on Netflix or Hulu or God knows what else and listen to something that takes the name of the Lord in vain. Now, I'm not saying that to condemn you, but just to maybe bring it to your attention tonight that maybe the Holy Spirit will grab you and help you to get back on the path and realize that you become what you feed upon. That's why it's so important for you to not let sin reign in your body. Then notice what he says after that. He says, do not present your members as instruments of righteousness. Now, what are members? Members are the parts of our body. Your eyes are members. Your hands are members. Your legs are members. So he's saying this body, this vehicle that God has given you, your spirit is born again. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotion. Scripture says you have to crucify that stuff daily. Take every thought captive, cast it down, and you've got to renew your mind by God's Word. Joshua 1, eight. let not the book of the law depart out of your mouth. Meditate on it day in and night. Keeping God's Word before your eyes so that it's health to all your flesh. We've got to stay in the Word so that we can grow and be what God calls us to be. But if we're not careful, we'll allow our members to be yielded 
just sin. But here's God's plan for us as walking dead men. It's not to yield our members to sin. He says, but rather present your body or yield your members to righteousness. Because we're not a slave to sin anymore. He that yields himself to sin is a slave to it. You know what the Bible says about, about, about us? The Bible calls us slaves. Now, I know in our culture that with, with Black History Month and everything that happened in the Americas, uh, the word slave is not a looked upon as a positive term. So I understand that. But in the day the Bible was written, which, by the way, slavery has gone on for a very long time, a slave, a slave could often also be met as uh, somebody who was a, an employer. It could be mean as employee, I mean. Uh, it could also be meant as you know slavery like they had back in those days. And the Bible says that no man can serve two masters. You're either going to serve God or you're going to serve money or yourself or flesh or whatever. And so if we present ourselves as uh, instruments of righteousness to God, what happens is, is that we, at that moment, flip off the switch of the devil. You see, here's the thing, folks. I've often said this. There are some of you who have been saved long enough. You've been sitting on the church pew. You've been reading the Bible. You've been coming to the small group. You've been coming to the Bible study. It's highly unlikely that you're going to cuss somebody out tomorrow. I mean, there are some people who have just gotten saved and, you know, they hadn't worked that part of their life out. So, you know, um, you know they, they might do that. But don't condemn them because you, you're judgmental. So, I mean, you know, how's your sin any different than theirs? Come on, that's a good place at home to say amen. But think about this. Think about this. If the devil can't get you to be bad... He can get you to be busy. And we're to be busy about the things of the kingdom. So here's the scriptural pattern. Here's the challenge. Not to let sin reign in our body, but not to yield ourselves to uh, sin, but to yield ourselves to members of unrighteousness. And this la makes me land on my final thought tonight as I get ready to close this Bible study. You and I as believers were never meant to sit dormant and not do anything. You know, God has not called any of us to be couch potato Christians. Or I would like to say it like this, He's not called any of us to be sponges. You know, people don't really use sponges a whole lot anymore in the kitchen. But I remember my grandmother used to use one. And uh, those sponges, you know, the yellow sponge with the green scrubber on top, some of you can see that right now, that image sitting up on the sink. You know, a sponge's purpose... If I were to ask you what a sponge's purpose is, many of you would say a sponge's purpose is to absorb. And while that is true, that is only one aspect of the dual nature of a sponge. A sponge is supposed to receive and also to release. But what happens when grandma would wash dishes and she would receive with, those, with the sponge and she would scrub and, and she would forget to wring it out. And she would lay it up there on the sink and the sun would hit it from the windowsill and it'd begin to mildew and get moldy and it'd be kind of funky. You know, that smell that you smell? Some of you can smell it right now, can't you? And then what happens is when you wring it out, it's kind of nasty. And that's the way believers are. When you don't function properly, you're not just hearing the Word, but you're supposed to be doing the Word. People say, well, I'm right with God. I, I heard this sermon. I heard this teaching. You know what James says? James says not to be just a hearer of the Word, but to be a doer also. Because if you only hear the Word and don't do it, you deceive yourself. Because while we're saved by faith, the Bible teaches that faith without cor correlating actions is dead. So we're not saved by our works, but our salvation is fruited or proved by our works. In other words, we don't do things to be saved. We do things as the fruit of salvation. In other words, when I'm saved, I want to serve God. I want to serve in the soup kitchen. I want to help somebody. I want to get involved in community projects. Be a small group leader, whatever. So listen, when you get born again and you die to yourself and you give up that sinful life, one of the ways to stay free is to yield your members to, as instruments of righteousness. James said it like this, Let he who stole steal no more but rather let him, let him labor, working with his hands, doing that which is good. You know, some of you 
have given your life to Christ and you found yourself in realms of temptation. And one of the things that I feel encouraged to tell you to do tonight is this, is to find some way to serve the body of Christ. If we're going to be a protege of Jesus Christ and we're truly going to be His disciple and we're going to lay our life down on the altar of God and crucify our flesh and follow after Him, then we're going to have to put ourselves in His hands so that He can work through us. I want to encourage you. Find somebody you can pray for. Find somebody you can bless. Listen, I, I'm, I feel this in my spirit right now. Some of you used to go out and you used to spend $35 a weekend on beer. What if you took that $35 and blessed a single mom? Some of you used to, you know, uh, do all this crazy stuff and you used to uh, take people home drunk. You know, you used to be the designated driver. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't drink and drive, but you would drive them home. Well, what about your church? Do, do they need a bus driver? Do they need somebody? How come you could take drunk people home, but you can't take kids home? Come on, somebody. You know, God wants you to use your gifts somewhere and hook up in the body of Christ and serve Him so that you can continue to grow and be fruitful in that area of your life.